What surrender ultimately does is it takes your life and it removes your responsibility and it puts it all on God. You put your life in God's hands. Everything about you now belongs to God. And then God can show you what His will is. Let's all turn to Nehemiah chapter 6 in verse 15 to 16. We'll stand as well and let's read together 15 and 16. Nehemiah 6. I'm going to talk about the subject of choosing to be a Christian leader. So Nehemiah chapter number 6, verse 15 and 16, if you'll read it together. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month Elo in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. You may be seated. I think leadership is a choice. It is, it has to be done in the heart of a Christian every day. Paul chose to be a leader and he encouraged others to do the same when he said, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. That was a choice that he was making. I believe that should be our greatest goal as well as leaders. We're not telling people to just follow us for the sake of following, but we're saying, follow me because I am following Christ. So our goal as Christians, our goal should be to lead people closer to Christ than when we found them. And this not only applies to the unsaved, but it should also apply to the Christians that we meet. Lead them closer to Christ than when we found them. God is the greatest leader. He looked at the problem and then he began to resolve it. That's one of the greatest traits of leadership. A quick way to understand the Bible is when you take it and you try to summarize it, the first three chapters, God creates and then humankind messes it up. And then the rest is God resolving it, God fixing the problem. Though the solution to the problem of sin exists, we know that it is Christ. People still need to be shown this solution. Now, for every problem, God has a solution. That's always been the case in history. For example, there was a problem. There was no one there to interpret the dreams in prison. These dreams of a baker and a butler. So the solution, God put a man in that prison named Joseph, who was able to interpret these dreams. God worked through Joseph. Another problem, Israel was captive for 400 years. They were made slaves. Solution, God used a man named Moses to bring them out of Egypt. There was a problem. Israel had no leader going into the promised land. Solution, God used Joshua to lead them into the promised land. So on and so forth, leaders pop out left and right throughout all of history, and God uses them. There are even many unsung leaders, leaders that aren't talked about sometimes throughout history. Some of these you would call pastors or preachers. Some of these you would call missionaries or evangelists. Some of these you would call deacons or faithful church workers. Some of these you would call faithful church members. Some of these you would call fathers and mothers. And some you would even call brothers and sisters. Now in our story, the problem was the city of Jerusalem was in disarray. And the solution, God had a man. God was about to rebuild Jerusalem with a man named Nehemiah. 
You see, leadership is actually a part of Christian living. It's a part of being a Christian. The life of Nehemiah is an outline of what godly leadership is. And I believe every one of us in a certain, is placed in a certain position for leadership. Whether greater or small. God doesn't just save us to just be followers. He saves us to be soon to be leaders. Now before we keep going, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for today, for just allowing us to be here, giving us safety, and just having your mercies always encompassing us. And we pray, Father, that we would understand this subject of leadership and how it applies to us every single day. I pray, Father, that every single one of us would understand this, this concept and apply it in our Christian lives and so that we could be used of you in a great and mighty way before you call us home. We pray, Lord, that every one of us would be able to be used of you. Thank you, Lord, and I praise you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we begin in the, the story of Nehemiah as a man that was placed in a very amazing position. He was what they call a cupbearer. Now, what is a cupbearer? I'm going to come back to that. Okay? In Nehemiah 1, so let's turn to Nehemiah 1. Nehemiah 1 uh, Nehemiah had just gotten word from a friend of his that the Jerusalem was in ruins. His people were dying. And it's not going too well. In fact, they needed a lot of help. This burdened Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a few choices he had to decide on. And these choices are also presented to us in a certain way every single day. When we face problems throughout our lives, these choices face us. These choices also help us to see what type of leader we, ought, we are already, and it allows us to make those changes so that we can become a more godly leader. What happened first was, number one, Nehemiah was saddened by the appalling conditions. Nehemiah wanted to do something about the problem. He heard the problem, now he reacted. He wanted to do something. Nehemiah 1, verse 1 to 4, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month uh, Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. See, Nehemiah, he wanted to do something. I think people... And Christians, I think we've gotten to that point where we've become desensitized to our, rea our reality that's facing us. We've gotten so comfortable in our place that we live in. And Hollywood has gotten really good at this too. They've got good at desensitizing us and showing us images of things that ought to move us, but they don't because we've just dismissed it in our minds and now it's just a part of daily life. Just last month, this became a reality for me. Uh, I had finished work, and I was heading down King George. I live south of here. So I was heading down King George, and on my way, between 64 and 72nd, if, you know, if you're a driver, you know where this is, between 64 and 72nd, I'm driving down King George, and there was a huge pileup of traffic. And I thought, okay, well, here I go, another rookie trying to do things, you know, because I was such a great driver. But as this traffic was slowly moving closer and closer, we noticed that the traffic was starting to merge more and more towards where the Rona used to be, where the Valley Village is. So as traffic is getting closer and closer, it's inching closer and closer, you can see more and more traffic getting into one line, trying to get around something. 
And I guessed it had to be this crash of some kind, right? It was getting closer and closer and closer. And what I noticed is this car wanted to take a left. And it would seem like the traffic had stopped for a moment to let the car through to take a left. But the traffic didn't want to stop or at least someone in the traffic didn't want to stop. It was a motorcyclist. And they tried to just go right through. So one thing leads to another. And next thing you know, I see that the wheel of the bike that had gone completely through the handlebars. I see the bumper hanging right down. And the scene, I think it took just a few seconds for me to realize what reality actually is. There was a man on the floor. There was people on the phone. There were trucks stopped everywhere. And this man, it was one of the most goriest scenes I had ever seen. There was blood everywhere. And you can see part of his limbs apart from the body. I'm not going to go further, but... At that moment in time, I was reminded that there is really a real hell that this man is about to enter, chances are. You see, there's a difference between seeing something on our screen oftentimes when we watch a movie or just go out in life, throughout life, but then it's completely different when you actually see it in reality. And this was not an actor. This was not a screenplay. There was no special effects. I was seeing this just a few meters away from where my car was passing by. Oftentimes, we forget that we are amusing ourselves with the illusions that this world places on us. And we forget that there is a, actually a reality. We can learn from Nehemiah that even though he was in this present circle, in this palace, that there was actually something happening around him, outside of his circle. I know it sounds a little basic, but oftentimes we have to remind ourselves it's not only about waking up and then attending to our family and then going to work, doing our 9-to-5 job, and then getting back home, to attending to our family, sleep, and then repeat. It's not only that. Our, there's more to life than that. There is so much more, and there is a bigger reality than what we are just surrounded with. Don't just look away from the problems. Let's face them. We need to face them. And Nehemiah chose to face them. This news that came to Nehemiah it stirred him to action. Right away, he got on his knees. He was a man that was responsible. He took on the initiative. He didn't make up an excuse like, well, I'm just a cupbearer. What can I do? I mean, to be honest, the job of a cupbearer was a good excuse for him not to do anything about what he was hearing in Jerusalem. But Nehemiah was saddened by the appalling conditions. Next, point number two, Nehemiah, he was surrendered to a great God. See, I told you what, I, what a cupbearer I told you I was going to tell you what a cupbearer is. A cupbearer's job was to eat and drink whatever the king was going to have. So the king, if he was going to get, have a filet mignon, well, the cupbearer gets the first bite. See, we have a lot of cupbearers, I know. But any comment that Nehemiah would have said, it would have been important. Any comment, right? So any reaction Nehemiah would have had to the food, the king was paying special attention because the king, he was paranoid. What if the food was poisoned? Anything Nehemiah could have said was going to be important to the king. Now think about it. The king, he was paranoid. He might have had food that was poisoned. So anything Nehemiah would have said, the king had to pay attention to. Nehemiah would be the one attending to the opinions of the king as well. King says the steak needs more salt. Well, Nehemiah is the man to do it. Making sure that the king had everything he needed in terms of eating and drinking. 
When the king felt thirsty, it was up to Nehemiah to drink a sip and then make sure to give it to the king. If it's the wrong temperature, it was up to Nehemiah to make sure it was the right temperature. This was the king. So let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Here's what happens. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Uh Uh-oh. Sad. And he says that he has never been sad in front of the king before. So the king is now paying more special attention to Nehemiah. Maybe the king thought, what if it's not Chardonnay? What if it's Burgundy? What if this wine is no good? What if it's the wrong temperature? What if this wine is bad? No, Nehemiah had something else going on. Because you see, Nehemiah was strategically placed by God in that specific place of a cupbearer. Remember, Nehemiah, he was already compelled. He was already wanting to do something. And he already knew of the problem that was happening in his homeland. So Nehemiah wanted to do something about that situation. And what you can probably say is that Nehemiah came to that proverbial why in his life. Where he can make one decision or he can make another decision. He had two choices. Do I tell the king about my burden of my homeland? Or do I stay where I am, comfortable in this palace, and just remain put? He needed wisdom from God. Wisdom to know God's will. So this begs the question, what is God's will for us even today? And I'd like to suggest that if you don't know God's will, to at least be surrendered to God. God can't use someone who isn't surrendered to Him. The unsurrendered Christian is the Christian who says that they want to be the pilot of their own life. Often this is when Christians choose the life of comfort, the life of status quo, the comfort zone, the life that isn't really going too far up or too far down. Because going too far up is too risky. Nehemiah could have just stayed quiet and just told the king, oh, the wine is bad. And just, uh, I'll just go get you another. Don't worry about it. He could have said that. But no. He was about to risk it all by saying, my people are dying. The surrendered Christians are the ones that God uses to move mountains while they don't even possess the means to do it. You see, if you want to level up in your Christian life, surrender your life to Christ. Every great Christian that had one time done something for God was a surrendered Christian. It was only after that that God showed that Christian what they need to do. You've heard it a bunch of times, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A surrendered heart. In history, it's said that Alexander the Great was known to like to conquer. It was his hobby to conquer. And so he would search all around, all around, all around the land to conquer. And back in Alexander's time, one of the things that was known is that east, at least the border of east, was where the Himalayan mountains were. So Nepal, India, China. That was the eastern border. So he wanted to conquer everything towards the east. So he kept going in this campaign towards India. Eventually, he got to India, and he found out that there was this beautiful princess named Roxana. So, what happened was, this beautiful princess also happened to be the next area he wanted to conquer. Now, he could get the princess easily, or he could conquer her. 
So what he did was he went towards the region of the Caucasus, which was close by to India. And when the king found out that this was what Alexander wanted to do, he stuffed his, uh, his uh, queen and his princess, this princess, in a fortress. And this fortress happened to be in, at the top where the cliffs were in, this, in these mountains. And when Alexander got to this fortress, he asked them, you need to surrender, because we'll win. So surrender your fortress and give me the girl. And while this was all happening, the king came up and he had his herald tell him, you can't take over, we have the upper ground. You have no means to come up into this fortress and we won't surrender. The only way you could possibly win is if you had men that could fly or have wings. Well, night came, Alexander camped in front of this fortress and then he had some men now these men, they were known to have done some climbing campaigns. They went out rock climbing. So 300 men is what he had to go scale up this mountain. And in the middle of the night, these men, they scaled up the mountain and they scaled up to the fortress and they hid inside of the walls. And so again, then the next morning came and Alexander said, give up, just surrender the fortress. And the king, he said the same exact thing he did last time. Well, Alexander called on his men. And one of the things that he had his men do was he had them have linen, uh, white linen cloth with them as they, were, as they were going up. So sure enough, he called on his men. They popped up and they were all surrounding the fortress. And by the time the king realized these, he was outnumbered, he was so demoralized that he just surrendered to Alexander the Great. The king understood that surrender in that campaign was only a matter of time. What is the difference between commitment and surrender? When you make a commitment, you're still in control. No matter how noble the thing you commit to, one can commit to pray, to study, to give his money, or to commit to car payments. Whatever he chooses to do, he commits to. But surrender is different. If someone holds a gun and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that person what you are committed to do. You just do it. You simply surrender and do as you are told. Surrendering involves you understanding who you are are surrendering to. Understand who God is. When God asks you to surrender to him, you have the choice to choose to surrender. But once you surrender, you will also realize that it was probably the best choice you ever made in your Christian life. What surrender ultimately does is it takes your life and it removes your responsibility and it puts it all on God. You put your life in God's hands. Everything about you now belongs to God. And then God can show you what his will is. So, Nehemiah understood the problem. Then he was surrendered. And now finally, Nehemiah was steadfast to the end. Nehemiah was a godly leader. And he shows us something incredible about godly leaders. This pattern once a godly leader starts to do God's work, they should not stop. Nehemiah chapter 6, turn with me there. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 3. Now remember, whenever you start to do something for God, the devil always has people to try and stop you. And the same was the case for Nehemiah. And you'll see it here in this story. Verse 1 to 3, it says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages 
in the plain of Ono. But they thought to uh, do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Perhaps the greatest thing to remember is that when you start doing something for God, the devil will start to oppose you. The world will try to stop you from doing the work of God. Do you know why it is always so tempting to stop doing something good? Because human nature doesn't like to suffer. I know it seems obvious, but human nature doesn't like to suffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the preachers during World War II, said, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ's suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him, or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world. But it is the same death every time, death in Jesus Christ, the death of the old man at his call. Be unstoppable. Be steadfast. And I'll conclude. There is really a lack of good leaders these days. Good leadership starts inside the heart and then the home. Do you know how important fathers are to their kids? Do you know how a family can be destroyed when a father is not a leader? I had to get my statistics from a few sources, but Psychology Today was one of them. For the longest time in psychology, this is one of the excerpts from this article written by this PhD uh, student. For the longest time in psychology, especially at the turn of the 20th century, so in the 1900s, or at least in the last 100 years, in the last 100 years, people diminished the importance of fathers in their family. They only thought that fathers were only there to make money and make the big decisions. Everything else is for the mother. They were wrong. In the last 40 years, the world started realizing how much mothers' and fathers' roles play a key in the children's development. Now, the absence of the father is the the single most important factor affecting crime. Number one, boys who are fatherless from, the birth, from birth are three times more likely to end up in jail than one with both parents. And boys who are fatherless between the age of 10 to 14 are twice as likely to end up in jail than one with both parents. Children without fathers are twice as likely to end up in prison before the age of 30 than ones raised in two-parent homes. The absence of a father bring about three prominent psychological effects. The first is lower intellectual development. Second is higher levels of illegitimate parenting in the teenage years. And the third was higher levels of welfare dependency. The absence of mothers plays a role also. Children with no mothers show issues with anxiety and feel the need to live up to people's expectation much more than most kids. Number two, they are more likely to suffer from personal image and self-esteem disorders. They show higher likelihoods of struggling with eating and sleeping disorders. Children with absent mothers show an increase in distrust of others 
and are more apt to suppress their feelings associated with love and companionship. Now, I want you to know, just because a father or mother wasn't there or parents didn't act like parents does not give license to someone to act badly. Every single person must make their own decisions in life. That's what they will be held accountable to in the end. But you need to understand that leadership can either start wars or it can end them. Leadership can inspire love or it can inspire fear. Leadership can help grow or it can kill. Leadership starts at the young age. And it starts in the heart. Now, let me ask you something. Are you saddened by the situation that's around you? Do you see the problems around you? Do you see the problems in reality? Does it move you to want to do something? Something. Or do you just want to settle for status quo and just be comfortable in your palace? Are you surrendered to Christ? Is the second question. Are you fully surrendered to Jesus Christ? If you think you are, do you still hold on to something and are wanting to dictate your own life, your own goals, rather than letting God have control of it, have ownership of it? And perhaps you're all of those things. Then are you steadfast? Are you faithful? in what you're doing? Can you call suffering your friend? Or is it something that can easily turn you away if something goes wrong in your life? Now you know school has started. September has come. Our schedules are starting to get back to normal. And in fact, everything else is starting to get back to normal too, right? And a lot of these things are subsiding, these issues, but uh, slowly we're getting back to normal. But somehow more and more people have decided that church, which was once necessary in their life, is not necessary anymore for some reason. More and more people have decided to follow the way of the world towards something else rather than towards Christ and what Christ wants them to do. A lot of people have decided I'm going to lead my crew or my team or whatever towards something else as opposed to leading them closer and closer to Christ. I don't know exactly where your background is, but God does have a plan for you. You may not have been born into the best of conditions in this world, but you can still be thankful that you can still serve God where you are. So, let's start the work. Let's start the work. Start the work with where you are at. You see the problem, now let God find the solution through you. You can be the leader that God wants you to be because we need leaders who will do the right thing. Leaders who will do as much as they can with what they have been given. Leaders who will seek after God's will and be fully surrendered to God. Leaders who won't stop doing good despite what the devil throws at them. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.